What is going on, wonderful people? It's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my pharmacology playlist. In the last video, we talked about sympathomimetics, or drugs that mimic the sympathetic nervous system. They were adrenergic agonists. As for today, we'll talk about the exact opposites. Medications that antagonize the sympathetic. They antagonize the adrenergic receptors. What are the adrenergic receptors? Alpha receptors and beta receptors. So today we'll talk about alpha blockers or alpha antagonists as well as beta blockers or beta receptor antagonists. So smash the like button, click the subscribe button and let's get started. For more videos like this one, please refer to my pharmacology playlist. It has more than 200 videos. This video was made possible thanks to the generous support of Maria. So please people take a moment to say thank you to Maria in the comments. In the last video, I've told you about the story of the two worlds, the insulin world and the glucagon world. Insulin alone is on one side. Every other hormone that you can imagine is anti-insulin. And I mean glucagon, epinephrine, cortisol, and thyroxine, all of them hate insulin. So it makes sense that epinephrine, i.e. the sympathetic nervous system, try to decrease insulin release. So what does the sympathetic nervous system want? It wants to decrease insulin. It wants to break down glycogen into glucose, i.e. sympathetic loves to stimulate glycogenolysis, which is anti-insulin because insulin prefers the opposite. Insulin likes glycogen synthesis or glycogenesis. What else does my sympathetic nervous system want? It wants to break down triglycerides into free fatty acids, i.e. lipolysis, which is an anti-insulin action because insulin wants the opposite. Insulin wants me to build up free fatty acids into triglycerides. The moral of the story is sympathetic hates insulin for the most part. Epinephrine inhibits insulin release from the pancreas. Now, what if I'm taking a sympathetic antagonist? What if I'm taking an alpha blocker, a beta blocker, a sympatholytic, an adrenergic antagonist? Well, 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 then the inhibitory effect on the insulin will be prevented and insulin will be secreted. If this is my postganglionic sympathetic fiber, it releases nor epinephrine or nor adrenaline, hence adrenergic fiber. And when you secrete nor adrenaline, you can act on alpha receptors or on beta receptors. Recall from the previous video that after norepinephrine is released from its adrenergic nerve terminus, it can act on alpha receptor, beta receptor, or the presynaptic alpha 2 receptor. And recall that alpha 2 is anti and 2 sympathetic, anti sympathetic meaning if you stimulate alpha-2, you will reduce the release of norepinephrine. Also, in the previous video, we have talked about the fact that alpha-1 is GQ, meaning calcium, meaning increased contraction of smooth muscles. Alpha-2 is GI, I for inhibitory, because when I stimulate alpha-2, I inhibit norepinephrine release. All the betas are GS coupled, meaning they will increase cyclic AMP, which is very important. If I stimulate GQ, calcium increases. If I stimulate GS, I stimulate adenylate cyclase, which converts ATP to cyclic AMP. So cyclic AMP goes up. But if I stimulate GI, which stands for inhibitory rather than stimulatory, then I get decreased cyclic AMP. In the last video, we talked about the sympathetic agonists. Today, we'll talk about those sympathetic antagonists, i.e. sympatholytics or adrenergic antagonists or adrenergic blockers. We'll also talk about alpha-2 agonists because alpha-2 agonists are anti-sympathetic. So let's say that I have a patient with high blood pressure. What is blood pressure? Well, blood pressure equals cardiac output multiplied by the total peripheral resistance. The cardiac output depends on what? Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. And the total peripheral resistance depends on what? It's the inverse of radius. As radius goes up, resistance goes down and vice versa. So how about giving an alpha-2 agonist to treat a patient with hypertension? If you give alpha-2 agonist, what's going to happen? You will reduce the release of norepinephrine and you will decrease the heart rate, stroke volume, which means you will decrease the cardiac output and you'll also decrease the total peripheral resistance. When this goes down and this goes down, blood pressure will decrease. What else can I do? You can give that patient alpha-1 blocker. If I give alpha-1 blocker, what's going to happen? You will not constrict your vessels. Instead, you will dilate them. The radius goes up, 
resistance goes down. When resistance goes down, blood pressure goes down, which means we can use alpha-1 blockers to treat patients with hypertension. What else? How about beta blockers? If I block the beta, I will lower the heart rate and stroke volume and therefore lower the cardiac output and the blood pressure will decrease. So the moral of this story is alpha-2 agonists can treat hypertension. Alpha-1 antagonists can also treat hypertension. And don't forget, beta antagonists can also treat hypertension. Please pause and review this beautiful chart that we talked about in the last video. If I give you an alpha-2 agonist, you will reduce your norepinephrine release. I can also block the alpha receptors with alpha blockers. I can block the beta receptors with beta blockers. I can prevent the entry of norepinephrine into the vesicle by giving reserpine. Alpha-1 receptors are GQ-coupled. When you stimulate alpha-1 receptors, you constrict your vessels and raise your blood pressure. Conversely, beta-1, beta-2, and beta-3 are GS-coupled. They increase cyclic AMP, and when you do this, you will relax your vessels, decreasing the resistance and decreasing the pressure. So when I stimulate alpha-1, I raise my blood pressure, but when I stimulate beta-2, I lower my blood pressure. Vasoconstriction versus vasodilation. So tell me about these adrenergic antagonists. You can block the alphas, such as blocking the alpha-1 with prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin, azlosin, tamsilosin. Or you can block the alpha-2 receptors such as euhembine and mirtazapine. How about the alpha-2 agonists? They include clonidine, alpha methyldopa, and others. Then help me block the beta receptors. We have many, many beta blockers, all of them, and in olol. What are the medications that can treat hypertension? Well, 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 let's talk about the sympatholytics. Some of them are centrally acting, which means they act on the presynaptic neuron, and these include the alpha-2 agonists, clonidine, alpha-methyldopa, and dexmedetomide. And we cannot forget reserpine, which inhibits VMAT, or the transporter of norepinephrine into the vesicle. After the centrally acting, what do we have? We have peripherally acting. On the postsynaptic membrane, we have the alpha and beta receptors. Alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2, etc. We can block the alphas with alpha blockers. Prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin, azlosin, tamsilosin. We can block the beta receptors by any drug that ends in olol, as in propranolol, metoprolol. There are many other ways to manage hypertension. Today, we're just focusing on the sympatholytics as well as quick review on the calcium channel blockers. Remember that calcium is the hero of contraction. So when you block the calcium, you block the contraction, so you will relax and lower your blood pressure. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the French toast you're talking about. Sympatholytics again, we have centrally acting and peripherally acting. Centrally acting. Let's reserve the norepinephrine, I mean restrict it, I mean prevent it from entering the vesicle by inhibiting the VMAT transporter protein, and this is the function of reserpine. Or let's stimulate the alpha-2 receptors to inhibit the release of norepinephrine so that I can lower my blood pressure. Clonidine, methyldopa, dexmedetomide. It's the infamous triad of CMD, clonidine, methyldopa, dexmedetomide. Then, the peripherally acting, you can block the alpha or you can block the beta. Let's start by talking about the centrally acting sympatholytics. What's going to happen? Well, whether you inhibit norepinephrine from entering the vesicle or you inhibit norepinephrine from leaving the axon terminus, the end result is the same. There is no norepinephrine available to function. So what do I get without the stimulating effect of norepinephrine in my brain? Sedation drowsiness, depression, and low libido, because everything is depressed. This is the central effect. The peripheral effect, well, there is no norepinephrine available to act on alpha-1 or beta-1. No acting on alpha-1, your blood pressure will drop. Every time your blood pressure drops, you trigger a baroreceptor reflex to cause the reflex tachycardia, which can also happen. When I inhibit the alpha-1 receptor, what's going to happen? I inhibit vasoconstriction, including venoconstriction. When the veins cannot constrict, they will be dilated like this. Lots of blood will pool into them and away from the right atrium, decreasing the venous return 
and I can get postural hypotension. Every time I stand up, blood pulls down, not in the heart, but in my ankles, I get postural hypotension because I could not constrict the veins. Why do healthy adults not suffer from postural hypotension? Because they have robust sympathetic fibers constricting the veins in the lower extremities to push the blood upwards towards the heart. But if I'm taking a centrally acting uh, sympatholytic or if I'm taking an alpha blocker, I can get postural hypotension. Moreover, remember the urinary bladder? Yes, I remember that. It had a sphincter. I remember that. How can we constrict and contract that sphincter? Alpha-1 stimulation. So alpha-1 can constrict that sphincter, which prevents the retrograde movement of the semen or the sperms or seminal fluids back into the bladder. Okay. So it's the constriction of the sphincter that prevents the retrograde ejaculation. But what's going to happen when I inhibit the alpha-1? Or what's going to happen when I lack norepinephrine stimulation to alpha-1? I cannot do this. I cannot constrict the sphincter. So the semen will go back to the bladder. And this is called retrograde ejaculation, one of the infamous side effects of alpha-1 blockers or centrally acting sympatholytics. When you inhibit your sympathetic nervous system, who's going to take over? Who's going to have the upper hand? Parasympathetic nervous system will be unopposed and unhinged. It will do its parasympathetic stuff. Rest and digest, secreto motor, all kinds of secretions and motility in my gut. I get diarrhea. I can get nausea, vomiting, of course. I can get urinary incontinence and stool incontinence because my bladder is pushing too much and my colon is pushing too hard rest and digest. Also, the parasympathetic is the hero of secretions, including gastric acid secretions, so I can worsen my previously existing peptic ulcer disease. Centrally acting sympatholytic. Number one, reserpine, how do you work? I work on your reserve. I restrict the entry of norepinephrine into the vesicle by irreversibly inhibiting VMAT, vesicle monoamine transporter. If norepinephrine cannot exit the vesicle, it will be unable to leave the vesicle later. The end result is no norepinephrine in the synapse, decreasing the stimulation of alpha-1, so I get decreased vascular tone, I get hypotension. Decreasing the stimulation of beta-1, I get decreased heart rate or bradycardia. So when should we use reserpine? In some cases of hypertension, at least theoretically. Today, almost no one uses reserpine ever. Side effects, uh, well, think about it. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. There is no norepinephrine, so I get depression, drowsiness, decreased libido. No alpha-1 stimulation. I can get retrograde ejaculation and orthostatic hypotension. No beta-1 stimulation. I can get bradycardia and heart block. That's why almost no one uses this today. Next, clonidine. Oh, we're starting the triad. Clonidine, alpha methyldopa, and dexmedetomide. How do they work? They stimulate alpha-2 receptors in the presynaptic neuron. Decreasing the release of norepinephrine. Same thing, you get hypotension and bradycardia. Why hypotension? Because you're not stimulating alpha-1. Why bradycardia? Because you're not stimulating beta-1. When should we use it? Well, think about it. It lowers your blood pressure, so I can use it if I have high blood pressure. Clonidine might alleviate the withdrawal symptoms of opiates. Think of opiates as depressants. When I remove the depressants, I get excited. Oh, I'm so excited. How can I inhibit this super excitation? you can take an inhibitor, such as clonidine, to decrease norepinephrine. See, it makes sense. What if I have too much excitation in the form of tremors? Oh, then you need to inhibit the CNS a little, such as by taking clonidine. Side effects. Well, too much inhibition of my CNS, I get sedation, drowsiness, delusion. It can also lead to dry mouth, vasodilation, and hypotension, because I'm not stimulating alpha-1 or beta-1. Remember, anytime a professor asks you about the side effects of a medication and you can remember absolutely nothing, just say the following four. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, xerostomia. And that's how you game the system. Next, methyl dopa, very similar to clonidine, okay? When do we use it? Same thing, hypertension, such as hypertension in pregnancy. Whether it's gestational hypertension, chronic hypertension, or preeclampsia. Side effects, uh, toxic to the liver, can lead to elevated liver enzymes, such as AST and ALT, also known as increased liver transaminases. It can lead to warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia with positive direct Coombs test. It's one of the medications that can give me drug-induced 
lupus with positive antihistone antibodies. Some argue that it can lead to hyperprolactinemia, which can lead to galacturia and amenorrhea in females, impotence and gynecomastia in males. How do I remember alpha methyl dope? I remember two arrows going up and two positive signs. I am increasing your liver function test because I'm toxic to the liver. I also cause hyperprolactinemia. Two positives. You get positive Coombs test because of the hemolysis and you get positive antihistone antibodies from the drug-induced lupus. What's the drug of choice for hypertension during pregnancy, especially mild to moderate hypertension? Alpha methyl dopa. What is the drug of choice to treat beta blocker toxicity? Don't forget glucagon for reasons that we'll discuss shortly. How do I manage hypertension during pregnancy? Just remember that hypertensive moms love nifedipine. What's the H? Hydralazine. What's the M? Alpha methyl dopa. What's the L? Labetalol. And what's the N in nifedipine? It is nifedipine. This is a vasodilator. This is an alpha-2 agonist. Labetalol, a lol, is a beta blocker and alpha blocker. Nifedipine is a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. There are three medications contraindicated in pregnancy that you need to memorize. ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and aliskyrin. These same three medications cause hyperkalemia as well. How about the third one in the triad? We talked about clonidine, alpha methyl dopa. Let's talk about dexmedetomide. Same exact thing. I lower your blood pressure. I lower your heart rate. My half-life is about two hours. When I decrease norepinephrine, I decrease the excitation of your brain. That's why you are sedative. And I have some analgesic effects. Side effects, I can be toxic to the liver. A large bolus of dexmedetomide can lead to paradoxical hypertension. How do I remember dexmedetomide? Everything here is D. It starts with a D. Its half-life or elimination half-life is two hours or two. It is a sedative and it can cause paradoxical hypertension. We're done with the centrally acting sympathiolytics. Now let's talk about the peripherally acting, starting with alpha blockers. Alpha receptor antagonists. These are the doozies that we'll talk about. Some of them block both alpha-1 and alpha-2. Some of them block only the alpha-1. Others block the alpha-2. These two are non-selective because they block everybody. These are selective alpha-1 blockers, and these two are selective alpha-2 blockers. Alpha receptor antagonists include phentolamine and phenoxybenzamine. They block both alpha-1 and alpha-2, which means they are non-selective because they block everybody. Next, prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin, alfozosin, tamsilosin. All of these are alpha-1 selective antagonists. Euhembine, selective on alpha-2. Mirtazabine, selective on alpha-2. If I am blocking the alpha, what's going to happen? Well, you can lower my blood pressure. If you block the alpha-1, yeah, so we can use them to treat hypertension, especially those who act on alpha-1. How about those who act on alpha-2? Well, remember that alpha-2 is antisympathetic. Alpha-2 decreases the release of norepinephrine. So when I block the alpha-2, I boost the release of norepinephrine. I can raise my blood pressure, so I can use this to treat hypotension. When I raise norepinephrine, I can use this to excite my brain and treat depression. But as for the alpha-1 blockers, they block the vasoconstriction, so you vasodilate. So my blood pressure drops. Amazing. And the vessels in my fingertips dilate so that they are not ischemic anymore, and they are not red, white, and blue. So they can treat Raynaud's disease. The difference between phentolamine and phenoxybenzamine is the fact that phentolamine is a reversible antagonist, but phenoxybenzamine is an irreversible antagonist. What do I need to know about phentolamine? Well, it is reversible, non-selective, alpha-1 and alpha-2 blocker. When you block the alpha-1, you will vasodilate. When you vasodilate, your blood pressure will drop, which can trigger a reflex tachycardia and arrhythmia. When you block your sympathetic like this, who's gonna predominate? Parasympathetic, secreto motor baby, increasing your GI motility, diarrhea, abdominal pain, you name it. For the phenoxybenzamine, it's non-selective, alpha-1 and alpha-2 antagonist, irreversibly blocking them, which means you cannot go back. Once you give phenoxybenzamine, you cannot reverse it. Oh, what should I do then? You gotta wait until the patient metabolizes all of the phenoxybenzamine. That's the only way to get rid of it. So phenoxybenzamine can accumulate with repeated dosing. So be very careful. If I can lower your blood pressure, what can I do? You can cause orthostatic hypotension. 
When you block the sympathetic, who predominates? The parasympathetic, and I can get meiosis or constriction of the pupil of my eye. When the parasympathetic predominates, it is secretomotor. It can increase my nasal secretions and give me some nasal congestion and stuffiness. Phenoxybenzamine can be used to treat pheochromocytoma, and the half-life is 24 hours. How do I treat pheochromocytoma? Well, pheochromocytoma is a tumor in the adrenal medulla secreting too much epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Oh, oh, oh. So how do I block the effect of epinephrine, for example? Epinephrine acts on alpha-1. It also acts on beta-1. That's true. So how do I block the alpha-1? Give me an alpha blocker. How do I block the beta-1? Give me a beta blocker. And this is a freaking tumor in my adrenal medulla. What should I do? Surgical excision. Alpha-1 agonists, prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin, tamsulosin. They block the alpha-1. That's why we can use them to treat benign prosthetic hyperplasia. How come? Well, here's the deal. Here's the urinary bladder, urethra, and then they are surrounded by the prostate gland. In patients with benign prosthetic hyperplasia or prosthetic enlargement, the prostate is gonna press on my urethra, making it harder to urinate. Oh, so how can we treat this? We'll try to prevent the constriction of the urethra. Oh, one way to do it is to relax the sphincter. How do I relax the sphincter? Since the sphincter responds to alpha-1 stimulation, you dilate it or relax it by alpha-1 blockers, such as prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin, tamsulosin. But when the sphincter dilates too much, what can happen is retrograde ejaculation. Is there any difference between prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin, and tamsulosin? The answer is yes. The first three can lower my blood pressure, and that's why we use them to treat hypertension. But tamsulosin usually keeps me normotensive without altering my blood pressure. So if a patient comes in with benign prosthetic enlargement and hypertension, you give one of these three. But if the patient comes in with benign prosthetic enlargement with normal blood pressure, go with tamsulose. Next, beta blockers. Beta blockers block the beta receptor, including beta 1 and or beta 2 receptors. When I block beta-1, what's going to happen? You will decrease your heart rate, contractility, and conductivity. What's going to happen to cardiac output? It decreases. Stroke volume? It decreases. Blood pressure can decrease as well. So when should I use beta blockers? To treat hypertension? Because they do lower my blood pressure. To treat tachyarrhythmias? Because they do lower my heart rate. To treat chronic congestive heart failure? Because they decrease my blood pressure, which means they decrease the afterload on the poor ventilator. They decrease heart rate and blood pressure. Oh, so we can benefit from this in a patient who has thyroid storm or thyrotoxicosis. In a patient with pheochromocytoma. And they also block beta-2 receptors. When I block beta-2, I cannot relax my bronchi and I cannot relax my vessels. If I cannot relax my vessels, they will not dilate and cause headache in my brain. So we can use them to prevent migraine headache. But when you block the beta, I'll be unable to dilate my bronchi. Oh, so I worsen the asthma. When you block the beta-2, I'm unable to metabolize stuff. Metabolism is toast. When I block beta-1, my heart rate can never go up, which will mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia. What does that mean? Think of my blood sugar dropping, and suppose that I am a healthy person. Anytime my blood sugar drops, the sympathetic nervous system gets activated. This is a dangerous situation, fight flight. So what's gonna happen? The sympathetic will raise heart rate, stroke, volume, blood pressure, etc. I'll start sweating, etc., etc. And this will alert me. Hey, doofus, maybe your blood sugar is low. You need to eat something. Oh, so I go and eat something. However, if this happens to me and I block the beta one, do you think tachycardia will happen? No, you will have hypoglycemia and you will not feel anything. Do you think increased stroke volume will happen? No, you will feel no palpitations whatsoever. So I'll have low blood sugar, but my body cannot alert me because I blocked the betas. And this is what we mean by masking the symptoms of hypoglycemia in patients with diabetes. When you block the beta-2, you cannot relax your vessels, so you are vulnerable to vasoconstriction and vasospasm. Vasospastic diseases such as Prenz metal angina, Renaud's phenomenon can get worse. Let's say that I have acute heart failure that is not caused by tachycardia. 
It's caused by something else. Well, acute heart failure means that my stroke volume is very poor. Oh, why would you give me beta blockers to make my stroke volume poorer and my heart rate lower? Not a good idea. So be very careful in some instances of acute heart failure, not all of them. Next, when I block the beta 2, I'll be unable to dilate my vessels. Oh, so my vessels tend to constrict, okay? And what else makes my vessels constrict? Pheochromocytoma, cocaine overdose, oh. So now cocaine, when the beta is blocked, will act more on alpha-1 receptors, cause severe vasoconstriction, which can kill me from the hypertension. Pheochromocytoma is the same thing. If you give a patient with pheochromocytoma beta blockers without blocking the alpha receptors first, all of that epinephrine or epinephrine will act on the alpha-1, causing severe vasoconstriction and severe increase in blood pressure. So when we treat pheochromocytoma, alpha blockers first, then beta blockers, then you go to surgery. Some effects of beta blockers. When you block the beta-1, you decrease heart rate and stroke volume, and you decrease the cardiac output. So the blood will pile up and pull up behind the poor ventricle, increasing the preload. Most students will get this wrong. Remember, beta blockers increase preload because they slow down the heart. When I block beta-1, there is no more renin. When I block beta-1, I decrease aqueous humor secretion in my eyes. That's why timolol, one of the beta blockers, can actually be used to treat glaucoma, which has increased intraocular pressure. Beta blockers decrease myocardial oxygen demand, which is awesome. That's why we can use them in patients with myocardial infarction. When I block beta-2, I cannot dilate my bronchi. I get bronchospasm. I cannot dilate my vessels. I get vasospasm. And I cannot metabolize anything. Say goodbye to glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. So be very careful in patients with diabetes because they already have metabolic dysfunction. If I block beta-3, say goodbye to lipolysis, so some lipids might accumulate in the blood because I could not break them down. Some beta blockers have something called intrinsic sympathomimetic activity. They are beta blockers, but they can boost the sympathetic to a certain extent. They are partial agonists. They will give you less bradycardia because they are more sympathomimetic. They can give you some bronchodilation because they are sympathomimetic. They cause minimal change in your blood lipids, which is awesome. Clinical uses of beta blockers. If I have angina or myocardial infarction, give me beta blockers. If I have tachyarrhythmias, give me beta blockers. Beta blockers are anti-angina and anti-arrhythmic medications. If I have glaucoma, I can benefit from them. If I have hypertension, I can benefit from them. If I have thyrotoxicosis or essential tremors or performance anxiety or migraine headache, I can benefit from propranolol. Side effects of beta blockers are many. They can cause nervousness. They can lead to some tremors. They can cause palpitations. They can worsen Raynaud's phenomenon and Prenn's metal angina because of all of the vasospasms. They can increase triglycerides and lower HDL. They can worsen asthma symptoms and peripheral vascular disease, which is Raynaud's. They can mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia in patients with diabetes. They can cause severe bradycardia and heart block. They are anti-sympathetic, so they cause CNS depression. They can cause sedation and they can lead to erectile dysfunction. Giving beta blockers before giving alpha blockers can worsen the symptoms of pheochromocytoma and cocaine overdose. Beta blockers clinical uses. They are anti-hypertensives. They are anti-heart failure. They are anti-angina, anti-arrhythmics. They are anti-cardiac remodeling in patients with CHF. They decrease sympathetic flow from the brain. They are anti-renin. They lower cardiac output and they are anti-vasodilation. You tend to constrict more. When should we use them for glaucoma, thyrotoxicosis, migraine headaches, essential tremors, performance anxiety, etc. Side effects are many. I can get bronchospasm, wheezing, I can get erectile dysfunction and sedation. My asthma or COPD can get worse if I'm taking a non-selective beta blocker that blocks the beta-2 receptor. My peripheral vascular diseases can get worse, such as Raynaud's phenomena. They mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia. They can lead to heart block from the bradycardia. They can lead to cardiogenic shock from the bradycardia and the decreased stroke volume and ejection fraction. 
they will worsen my Renaud's phenomenon and Prince metal angina, i.e. they worsen vasospastic diseases. Beta blockers is one of those medications that you should not stop suddenly, because if you stop them suddenly, you get the opposite of their desired effect. You get sudden hypertension, rebound hypertension, you can get rebound arrhythmia, and much more. Beta blockers end in olol, but if you have a medication that ends in alol, such as sotalol, then that's a potassium channel blocker with some beta blocker activity. Chronic use of beta blockers, well, I have been blocking this receptor for years and years and years. My body will make more. That's a negative feedback. It causes upregulation of the beta receptors. And that's why you should not stop them suddenly. Sudden withdrawal of beta blockers can lead to rebound effects. Rebound hypertension, rebound tachyarrhythmia, etc. If you want to withdraw, gradually taper the dose. Baby steps. Not suddenly. Beta blockers have additive bradycardic effects with joxin, adenosine, or calcium channel blockers. If I take beta blockers and calcium channel blockers together, I am more likely to develop bradycardia. If I have beta blocker toxicity, what should I do? I should take glucagon. Why is this? Because beta blockers block the beta, i.e. they lower the cyclic AMP, but the glucagon raises cyclic AMP. Oh, so it's kind of an antidote. True. Beta blockers classification. The non-selective beta blockers, i.e. the ones who block the beta 1 and the beta 2, they block everybody, they do not care, are drugs that start with N or start with any letter between N and Z and end in olol, such as nadolol, propranolol, timolol, etc. As for sotalol, it is a beta blocker and a potassium channel blocker. Be very careful with propranolol because it's about 95% bound to plasma proteins, which means it can interact with other medications that also love to bind plasma proteins. We have selective beta-1 blockers. They block beta-1 only and not beta-2 for the most part. And these are the beta blockers that start with letter A all the way through M, such as atenolol, bituxolol, bisoprolol, esmolol, metoprolol. Then we have the beta partial agonists, which are beta blockers plus some intrinsic sympathomimetic activities. How do I remember the partial agonist? I think of an ACE card partially coming in front of a pendulum. Acibutalol and pendulol. Then I have beta blockers that block the beta and the alpha-1, also known as third-generation beta blockers, labetalol and carvedilol. Then beta blockers plus nitric oxide releasers. This is nebevalol. Nitric oxide with an N, nebevalol with an N. Can we use beta blockers for angina? Yeah, for every kind of angina you can imagine, except Prenn's metal angina, because it has vasospasm. Try to avoid the use of the partial beta agonists in case of angina, such as acipitalol and pendulol. Beta blockers improve longevity and reduce mortality post-MI. Beta blockers as anti-anginal. Avoid in Prenn's metal angina, avoid the partial agonists, and avoid in acute heart failure not caused by tachycardia. Can we use beta blockers to treat arrhythmia? Yes, beta blockers are class 2 antiarrhythmics. They slow down your AV node and SA node. What are the beta blockers that can be used for arrhythmia? Especially esmolol, metoprolol, and propranolol. These beta blockers can be used post MI as well as to treat supraventricular tachycardia. But don't forget that they can slow down my heart, leading to heart block. Let's talk more about esmolol. It is a selective beta-1 antagonist. It starts with a letter that's before the N. From A to M. It has rapid onset, short duration, which means rapid onset, rapid offset. Easy come, easy go. It gets metabolized into methanol, but that's not very significant to cause toxicity. When should we use it? We can use it to prevent arrhythmia or to treat arrhythmia. Sometimes arrhythmia happens when we're intubating the patient or with direct laryngoscopy. So we can use esmolol to prevent the arrhythmia. The half-life of esmolol is short. It's about 9 minutes. Easy come, easy go. When should we use it again? Thyrotoxicosis, chromocytoma, cocaine-induced toxicity of the heart only after you give an alpha blocker. It can also treat the hypercyanotic spells in Tetralogy of Fallot, which we have talked about it before in my video on Tetralogy of Fallot. You can find it in my cardiology playlist. Next, let's talk about labetalol. 
it is non-selective beta as well as alpha-1 blocker. So it blocks beta, it blocks alpha-1. When you block alpha-1, you cause vasodilation. When should we use labetalol? We can use it to treat congestive heart failure, to treat hypertension, to treat angina. Can I use this during pregnancy? Yeah, remember that hypertensive moms love nifedipine. The L was the labetalol. The half-life is about six hours. And if I have liver disease, be very careful because it will take me longer to metabolize it. Is it affected by kidney disease? No, it's not. Just the liver disease. When you decrease my blood pressure, I can get orthostasis, especially since you block the alpha-1. And when you block the beta-2, I can get bronchospasm. And there you go. Everything about the toxicity of beta blockers in one slide. How do I treat this toxicity? Remember, it's emergency, so your ABC is first. The antidote is glucagon. Beta blockers lower cyclic AMP, but glucagon raises cyclic AMP. And that was the story of the beta blockers or beta receptor antagonists. They are peripherally acting sympatholytics. How do we treat hypertensive urgency or emergency? Let's say that my systolic blood pressure is 200 and my diastolic is 120. Well, we can give you nicardipine, clividipine. We can give labetalol or esmolol. We can give phenoldepam. We can give hydralazine, etc. So today you learn about a category of medications that inhibit postsynaptic receptors. You learn about alpha blockers and beta blockers. Quick review on calcium channel blockers. Remember that calcium is the hero of contraction, contraction of cardiac muscles and contraction of smooth muscles in vessels. But when I give you a calcium channel blockers, your heart contractility will decrease and your vessel will not constrict. Instead, your vessel will dilate, your heart rate will decrease, your stroke volume will decrease. So if my heart rate will decrease, if my stroke volume will decrease, if my vessels will dilate, can I use calcium channel blockers to treat hypertension? Yes. There are two types of calcium channel blockers. Those who focus more on vessels, i.e. smooth muscles, and those who focus more on the heart, i.e. cardiac muscles. Which ones focus more on vessels? The dihydroperidine calcium channel blockers. Look at the name. Nifedipine rhymes with dihydroperidine. Nimodipine, nifedipine, amlodipine, and much more. Which ones focus more on the heart? Verapamil is the most important, followed by deltaism. Calcium channel blockers can be used to treat hypertension. They can also be used to treat arrhythmia because they slow down your SA node and AV node, just like the beta blockers. Nifedipine acts more on vessels. Verapamil acts more on the heart. Deltaism is kind of in between, more closer to the heart than to vessels. Nifedipine is gonna decrease my vasoconstriction, which decreases my total peripheral resistance. Verapamil will decrease my heart rate, it will decrease my stroke volume and the conduction in the SA node and AV node. When I say calcium channel blockers, which calcium channel am I referring to? Um, I'm referring to the L-type calcium channel. Remember, L is in the ventricle. So calcium channel blockers block the L-type calcium channels. They are also in the smooth muscles of your vessel. How about the T-type calcium channels? No, the T-type calcium channel was involved in the thalamus, and we talked about them in my video on the anti-seizure medications. If I take nifedipine, what's going to happen to my blood vessel? My blood vessel will not constrict, it will dilate. When I dilate the veins, what's going to happen? Preload will drop. When I dilate my arteries, what's going to happen? Afterload will decrease. So this decreases the cardiac work and decreases the oxygen demand. When I dilate my coronary, I increase oxygen supply to the heart, which is awesome. How about verapamil and deltaism? They focus on the heart, so they decrease heart rate, they decrease contractility, which decreases stroke volume. This also decreases oxygen demand. And that's why we can use these calcium channel blockers to manage hypertension and to manage hypertension with angina. We can also use them as antiarrhythmics. Side effects of calcium channel blockers, gingival hyperplasia, when I decrease my blood pressure, I get hypotension. Anytime I get hypotension, I can develop reflex tachycardia. How can I prevent the reflex tachycardia? Block the beta-1 receptor on your heart. What else can they do? Well, 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 if you slow down your heart a lot, you can get heart failure. If you slow down your heart a lot, you can get AV nodal block from the severe bradycardia. If you slow down your bowel, you get constipation. Veravimil can also lead to hyperprolactinemia, which causes amenorrhea and galactorrhea in females, 
impotence and gynecomastia in males. And there you have it. Today we learned about the sympatholytics and we have learned about the calcium channel blockers. Please take a moment to pause and review. We use phentolamine and phenoxybenzamine to treat hypertension and pheochromocytoma. Prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin treat hypertension and benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Tamsulosin treats benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Euhembine might treat hypotension or postural hypotension. Mirtazapine might be beneficial in depression. The beta blockers are antihypertension, antiangina and MI, antiarrhythmics, and anti-CHF. The calcium channel blockers are anti-CHF, antihypertensives, and antiarrhythmics. If you want to learn more about autonomic pharmacology, I have a complete course on this topic on my website medicosisperfectionalis.com. It comes with videos, cases, and notes. To learn more about the antiarrhythmics, antianginal drugs, antihyperlipidemics, digoxin, and the diuretics, download my cardiac pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. There are more than 300 premium videos available on this channel when you click the join button and choose the highest tier. Please subscribe, hit the bell, click the join button, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo, go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you would like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.